I too want to welcome all of you, uh, members of the President's Club, to uh, the International Quilt Study Center on behalf of the Department of Textiles, Clothing, and Design, which is the parent department of, uh, of this, uh, this institution. Um, when the IQSC was, and I'm going to use IQSC henceforth, because the International Quilt Study Center is a mouthful. Uh, when it was created in 1997, one primary objective um, of its mission was the study of quilts and quilt making traditions. The development of a graduate curriculum in textile history with a quilt studies emphasis provided a formal context for that part of the IQSC's mission. It's a unique program in that it's conducted both on campus and online. Some graduate students come here to Lincoln to do their Master of Arts and their PhD degrees in quilt studies. And others do likewise from home bases all across the US coming to UNL one semester during their program of study. Both residential and distant students, whoops, what did I do? This is the trouble with technology. You touched the wrong button. Oh, there we go. Okay. I didn't really want to move it. I just moved my hand. Um, uh, both residential and distance students take advantage of the distance delivery courses that are part of this program. So even if they're on campus, sometimes they're taking an online course. And non-residential students also take relevant and appropriate courses at universities and colleges in their geographic areas. I have a student right now who just took a string of courses at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison um, in their art history department as part of her program. The courses we offer for this program are taught by senior faculty in the department, as well as by visiting lecturers and scholars from other institutions. They range from research and writing intensive courses to studio-based courses, and they explore the broad range of historic periods and styles that locate quilts along a timeline that spans many centuries. They emphasize and explore both the aesthetic as well as the material culture value of these objects, and they prepare students for eventual careers as museum and historical society curators, museum registrars, collections managers, independent researchers, quilt historians, artists and designers, and academics. The collection also serves a re as a resource tool for courses in the department that are not specifically aimed at the textile history quilt studies majors. A number of our undergraduate and graduate courses in textile design have used the IQSC collections as focal points for the development of new and original art and design work. This is an example of something that was developed out of a study of one of the quilts, in the, a fabric in one of the quilts in the collection in an undergraduate um, actually it was an undergraduate graduate course a couple of years ago. Quilts are unique in the ways that they link so many different interfaces with the world, both past and present. They are artistically creative objects, and they touch on and encompass history, including world history, art history, women's history, and so on. The social sciences, religion, politics, literature, theater, mathematics, and even the hard sciences. In the techniques and visual tendencies that their forms embody, they represent imagination, improvisation, and innovation. As more and more scholars today recognize, quilts are records of the lives and the experiences of their makers, mostly but not exclusively women, across centuries and across broad swaths of the world's territories. Quilts and their variants were made and are made in North America, South America, in Europe, in the Middle East, in Asia, including in India, in Pakistan, in China, Japan, and Korea, and in the Pacific. Hawaiian quilts, perhaps most notably, but there's also the burgeoning contemporary quilt movement in places like Australia and New Zealand. Their quilts are an excellent vehicle for understanding how humans relate to their communities, to their artistic and cultural heritages, and to one another. I'll share with you very briefly and quickly at breakneck speed uh, this afternoon some of the work that we've done 
in and some of the outcomes of four graduate courses that we've offered in textiles, clothing, and design that have depended on and used the resources of the International Quilt Study Center. The first was offered as TXCD 873, Design Perspectives and Issues Material Response in the fall of 2003. The other three were all offered as part of the Textile History Quilt Studies major. Design Perspectives and Issues Material Response invited TCD textile and apparel design majors as well as printmaking and painting graduate students from the Department of Art and Art History to meet in a seminar format to examine issues related to appropriation in the visual arts. Now, Wiki, Wikipedia defines appropriation at, in the visual arts specifically this way. They say it's the use of borrowed elements in the creation of new work. The borrowed elements may include images, forms, or styles from art history or from popular culture or materials and techniques from non-art contexts. Since the 1980s, the term has also referred more specifically to artists quoting the work of another artist to create their own new work. So that's the notion of, of appropriation that we examined in this course. The students used the IQSC collections to explore the interface between textile art traditions, such as quilt making, and other art and craft media. They explored how the dialogue between past and present informs the work of contemporary creative artists and designers. They each chose specific works from the collection and used them as springboards to develop original creative works that responded in some evident way to those source quilts. Their responses could be in any medium and could take whatever conceptual uh, form the maker chose. It could be an homage to the work itself or to its maker. It could be a critique of the work or it could be an appropriation of the work to serve an al alternate purpose, such as a, a political or an allegorical or a subversive or transgressive purpose. In the course of the semester, of that particular semester, the participating students interpreted, deconstructed, questioned, and synthesized the concepts discussed in the various readings that were assigned. Considered, they considered the quilt form in diverse cultural, artistic, and historical contexts. They considered their own creative work in relation to such traditional and vernacular artistic practices as quilt making. And in the Robert Hillstad Textiles Gallery exhibition that closed the course and uh, some selections that you're uh, represented in these slides that you're looking at, they presented a work or a series of works created during that semester that reflected both a strong personal vision and a serious level of investigation relative to the source quilt alongside which the new work was exhibited when the show was installed. At the outset of one of the essays that we read and discussed in this, this course, an essay titled Sister's Choice, Quilting Aesthetics in Contemporary African American Women's Fiction. The author, Dr. Mago Ann Kelly, referred to another text by Dr. Elsa Bockley Brown, who's now at the University of Maryland College Park, in which Dr. Brown explained that, quote, quilts provide an excellent analytic framework for courses by enabling students to center in another experience to validate it and judge it by its own standards, unquote. This opportunity to become intimate with diverse traditions and practices of quilt making and the visionary artistic imperatives reflected in the surfaces and in the substance of the quilts that the students in the course responded to demonstrates the capacity of quilts to speak across time, to speak through human experience and of the human condition and to inspire a continuing practice of engagement with the creative process. In the summer of 2004, we offered TXCD 905D, Design Perspectives and Issues, Quilt Aesthetics, 
a course in which we examined issues in, in aesthetics as related to both historical and non-traditional quilts. As with all online courses here at UNL, this one took place in the Blackboard classroom, a virtual environment that offers a range of technological tools and forums in which instructors and students can engage in dynamic teaching and learning experiences. The course was scaffolded on extensive readings in aesthetics and in the areas of art and design theory, craft theory, and critical theory. And these readings supported analytical and critical writing about selected works from the IQSC collections. Among the key objectives of this course were these. To engage with the quilt surface as an art design expression. To bring the specifics of art design language to the discussion of quilts in such a way that insights into the significance of a quilt surface design might be more readily understood. To approach the analysis and interpretation of quilt surface design from a number of standpoints in order to better understand the relationship of the quilt to other art forms. And finally, to place qu the quilt in a broad aesthetic context in order to better understand the influences that have contributed to its acceptance as art. As the instructor, I expected by the end of the course that participants would gain an increased level of confidence in describing, interpreting, judging, and evaluating quilts on aesthetic rather than purely historical material or technical criteria. <clears throat> Students completed assigned readings for posted deadlines. They did supplementary reading whenever necessary to amplify their understanding of the assigned text and the ongoing discussion. They completed four short written papers in response to assigned topics key to specific quilts from the collections. They participated actively and consistently in the online discussion boards. And as a final project, they wrote a curatorial statement and a set of didactic labels, label texts to accompany a hypothetical exhibition of a group of IQSC quilts. When students take courses with me, they're forced to really work. Perhaps the most personally interesting and challenging course with which I've been involved online was the fall 2005 offering of Quilt Arts Curricular Arts, a course that I created in collaboration with Dr. Margaret McIntyre Lada, Associate Professor in the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Teacher Education. Conceived in response to a call for proposals in what was at that point the new College of Education and Human Sciences, intended to encourage multidisciplinary initiatives across the college. Our idea was to use the resources and collections of the IQSC and foreground them as vehicles for K through 16 educators in both traditional and non-traditional educational sites. That is, in schools on the one hand and in museums and other community organizations on the other. Educators would have the opportunity to examine and study quilts as artistic and cultural forms while simultaneously engaging in interdisciplinary dialogue and designing related curricular materials and educational programs appropriate to their particular work sites or in conjunction with a museum exhibit, for example. The roster of the course included textile history, quilt studies, TCD, master's students, as well as both master's and PhD students from teaching, learning, and teacher education spread broadly across this state, across the nation, and participating from as far afield as Japan. One of our students was in Japan for the duration of the course. Anchored in part by the writings and research of such educational and aesthetic theorists as John Dewey, William H. Schuber, Elliot Eisner, Wanda May, Maxine Green, and William Dahl, Jr., the course attempted to answer the questions, and here I'm going to paraphrase the title of one of the journal articles that Dr. Eisner wrote that was one of our readings. What can education learn from quilts?
about the practice of education and how can educational theory inform our understanding of quilts and their potential as curricular artifacts. 20th century Russian cultural liter and literary theorist Mikhail Bakht Bakhtin's notion of the dialogic provided a leitmotif for the course and its investigations. First applied by Bakhtin to the study of language in the 1920s, as pointed out in Paul Boissac's Encyclopedia of Semiotics, it asserted, to quote John Fielder, referencing Bakhtin in his entry on dialogism in that volume, that, quote, language functions in a doubling pluralistic fashion, unquote. The act of communication that language serves, rooted in notions of self and other, has close parallels in the arts, where communication is inevitably the purpose and the outcome of artistic practice. The artist, here the quilt maker or the educator, and the artwork, the thing made, the quilt or the curriculum, function as embodiments of self. The viewer and the student exist as other, and these parties inevitably have something to say to one another across time and space and through the artifacts of their practice. The visual language engaged by the quilt maker in orchestrating the imagery on the quilt's surface, the pedagogical language engaged by the educator in articulating a strategy for facilitating deep knowing and the meanings that both of these makers intend constitute a form of, dialog of the dialogic that we attempted to bring to life in the environment of this course, and that in hindsight, I think we largely succeeded in doing. In March of 2007, at the IQSC's third biennial symposium, Traditions and Trajectories, Education and the Quilt Maker, Several students who participated in this course presented in PowerPoint form their final summative projects as evidence of this dialogic engagement. They had a choice of two possible frameworks for that final exercise. They could do a biography of learning that could take multiple forms, including but not limited to poems, prose, letters, an essay, a photographic essay, or a multimedia technological and or artistic product that demonstrated the students' growing awareness of quilts as an artistic cultural form in relation to self and others, and demonstrating the students' ability to read quilts from multiple viewpoints. Or they could do an independent inquiry in which the student would create curricular materials focused on a theme of study designed to utilize the IQSC resources and its collections as a medium for learning and developed for use in a particular educational site. The student would create a curricular framework intended to support and foster learning connections given the particulars of the teaching learning context. From this charge came the culminating curricula and reflective products representing a number of quite different purviews and orientations. Their eclecticism suggests the flexible and adaptable nature of the course itself. Each individual was able to incorporate or build on her or his specific interests, experiences, and disciplinary background to fashion outcomes that could service unique and diverse audiences across a range of learning environments. These summative projects demonstrated the piecing together of diverse strategies aimed at articulating pathways of both self-discovery and curricula enterprise. Graduate student Kate Seidick nicely summarized some of the goals of this course when she wrote, connecting curriculum to students' lived experience allows them to answer fundamentally human questions, questions such as, who am I? and what stories do I have to share? When students are dynamically involved in their own learning, they can build a base platform of knowledge and from that create linkages and bridges that allow them to relate to the experiences of others. 
Although a difficult challenge for educators and curriculum developers constrained by today's no child left behind policies, fostering these characteristics in students is important to developing intellect, creativity, and a secure self-identity. And I want to add that, that I, I got that quote of Kate's from part of an online discussion. And it suggests the, the, the depth that the students get to talking back and forth to each other in that forum. It was quite impressive. I'm still assessing the last course that I'm going to highlight here and the most recent offering in our online hybrid distance program, the Studio Quilt Movement, Genesis and Development, took an in-depth look at the so-called Art Quilt Movement and the precedents and context that gave rise to its flowering between 1965 and 1985. We studied individual makers and their works, and students researched and compiled detailed information for an as yet unfinished timeline. This is now my homework to get this timeline done over the summer. A timeline of key events from that era that will contribute to the development of a chronological map of the period. In addition, students interviewed key individuals active as quilt artists when this form was evolving into something uniquely different from the quilt and other fiber and textile arts traditions with which previous generations were familiar. Textile history quilt studies PhD student Jonathan Gregory, for example, interviewed Massachusetts artist Nancy Halpern, whose involvement with quilts goes back to the late 1960s. As she told Jonathan, by the time she'd established herself as a recognizable name in the alternative quilt world, she found herself challenged to educate a lay audience that had a fixed idea of what quilts were. She explained the difficulty to Jonathan. This is a quote from her in that interview. The hardest thing of all was trying to describe to people what I was, especially when I was on a plane. I would say, I'm a quilt maker. They would say, oh yeah, my grandma used to make quilts. And I would have to go through that whole thing. Finally, I started carrying around pictures of my work with me, so then I could just say, I'm a quilt maker. This is the kind of thing that I do. Then they'd say, oh, you make tapestries. No, I don't make tapestries. I make quilts. And this is what they look like. That's the quote. And master's student Peggy Derrick, who interviewed artist David Hornung, one of several on the list of the students' interview subjects who eventually moved into other media and no longer make quilts, writes in her paper, which was titled Betwixt and Between the Conundrum of the Studio Art Quilt, and this is a quote from that essay, even as fine artists explore all sorts of materials and techniques, the dedicated maker of any art that has a tradition rooted in craft and function is still caught in the position of having to explain himself to the art world. A quilt, to some viewers, is still a bed covering, even if it's hanging on a wall. And art cannot simultaneously be a bed covering. This is why quilt maker Radka Donnell, why quilt, quilt maker Radka Donnell's insistence on the duality of her work is so radical. They are bed coverings, and they are art. One function does not neutralize the other, in her opinion. And though Hornung laments the conundrum that has kept studio quilts in suspension between two worlds, he absolutely believes in their expressive power. Speaking of quilts, the quilts of the pioneer studio quilter Nancy Crow, he declared, and this is her interview subject speaking, when you see one in person, and it's a good one, a really good Nancy Crow, all those arguments to me just go out the window. You're just so, and the, the power and the authenticity of the thing is so pronounced. And that's the argument against the conundrum. It needs to be on the wall, and it's powerful on the wall, and it's arresting. It doesn't need any apologies or explanations. Needless to say, she got an A for this paper. In challenging course participants to synthesize the learning that they took from the course readings, from the interviews they conducted, 
from the discussion boards and the timeline research to which they each contributed, and in a well-argued summative essay to make sense of that period. I asked them to take charge of their individual and their collective learning processes. While the declared object was to shed light on and in increase our understanding of why the quilt changed so radically at that particular moment, and how broader social, cultural, political, and artistic forces impacted this change, the subtext was more subtle. When the curricula interfaces with the personal, the opportunity for real intellectual growth and for perspective-altering insights is multiplied, and the results for the student are formative. As one student expressed it in her final discussion board post, I didn't bring any context to this class. I knew nothing about quilts before I took the course, and now I feel I know something about a particular kind of quilt and the context in which it fits. I was particularly interested in the assigned readings. The analyses in those works were the most meaningful to me and helped me to understand the importance and place of studio quilts in the larger art world and in the social context. The, the group work was particularly helpful to me as I learned as much from my classmates and my group activity cohorts as from other activities. My cohort partners were particularly generous in guiding my research efforts when I was flailing around. <clears throat> in the syllabus for the Quilt Arts Curricular Arts Seminar that Dr. Lada and I delivered in 2005, Dr. Lada wrote, an operating assumption regarding the nature of curriculum for this seminar is that curriculum entails a making process between students, teacher, and subject matter that is reciprocal and ongoing. The ensuing intersections are personal and are embodied in and derived from the narratives of experience. I find that each of the courses that I've spotlighted for you this afternoon provide evidence that locating intersections of experience and enabling synergistic reciprocity in our teaching, learning, and research environments define much of what we do in textiles, clothing, in, and design, and in the programs of the International Quilt Studies Center. 